So we want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're grateful to the Lord for you all being here today. All right, so we're going to get right into the word. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the eighth chapter of the book of Mark. start reading at verse 34. All right, the eighth chapter of the book of Mark, we're going to start reading at verse 34. It says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, now I want you to notice how that scripture starts off. Again, now everything, everything that we read in this Bible is in there for a reason. And um, every word that God allowed to be in here, uh, every phrase is in there for a reason. And so when you read the scriptures, you have to think, what was God thinking when he allowed to be that, be there, when he allowed that to be there? What was on his mind and what are his thoughts that he's trying to convey unto us? You know, they say one of the biggest issues in marriage, uh, one of the biggest things that causes friction between husband and wife is communication. The husband say one thing, the wife hears another. The husband can say, uh, sweetheart, uh, the wife can cook, and the husband can say, sweetheart, will you pass me the salt? What is she hearing? Oh, you don't like my cooking. No, I just want more salt. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't eat it. See? And so <laughs> that's one of the things that uh, very few married people master, the art of communication. We think different. And so we can perceive things differently. And of course, there's no room for that. You know, th those are the things that the devil play on. Uh, I'm saying one thing, uh, but you're hearing another, and oftentimes uh, people hear through their own filter. Everybody understand? Uh, people hear through their own filter. If I got hurt, especially from my past and, and past relationships, then whatever you say to me is going to be processed through that hurt. And so if I, if, um, if I correct you and, and you're a hurt person, then my correction and love is going to look like rejection to you. Now, so it's not, but you know, and we in our own, in our own marriages, we can try to get around things and try to, um, uh, try to adjust to one another, you know, um, but God does not adjust. Everybody understand? He does not adjust. He hasn't come down here not one time and changed anything in his word to make us feel better because we're processing it through hurt. And so, that's, that's so, if, so we know that if in marriage uh, we can um, have miscommunication, then the same can be true when we're reading God's word. Now, it's very important that those people that are on the receiving end you get an understanding of what the person who's on the transmitting end wants you to get. Everybody understand? If, he's, if a person is sharing a thought with you, then you make sure that you understand their thought before you ready to chop their head off. Make sure you understand what it is that they are trying to convey over to you before you take it and have a bad day for the rest of the week. And the devil is a master at that. Uh, folks walking around feeling bad about something they shouldn't be feeling bad about all because they took it the wrong way and, and, and too proud to ask for a real understanding. Now you know that's pride in and of itself where I can just assume I'm understanding what you're saying and I'm taking it and running with it. And so that's the same, it's the same way with God, you know, and I'm just pointing that out in marriage because if we do it in marriage, we'll do it with God as well, where God is trying to convey over his thoughts 
But if we so caught up in ourselves and we just taking it however, however we take it, never mind how God meant it. That's why the Bible says out of the, uh, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Everybody understand? And so, and, and, and for that very reason is why we have so many denominations today. People taking it how they want to take it. If you don't see it in the mouth of two or three witnesses, then you know that it's, it's wrong. And that's the dangerous thing about this Bible. You can take anything out of that and, and build a whole doctrine and denomination on it. Everybody understand? And so that's not God's will. <laughs> the Pharisees came to Jesus one day and said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife to divorce his wife? Because Moses allowed us to do it. It's written in his law that we could do it. And what did Jesus say? Only because of the hardness of your heart. He said, but what? From the beginning, it was not so. And so somebody that just reading the word and just looking for a reason to do things, you'll find it. You want to have more than one wife? You'll find a great man of God, David, King David, more than one wife. Everybody see? I tell you, people take, take one thing and build a whole, it's got a whole denomination out there of folks marrying more than one, more than one wife and saying, well, King, King David was a man after God's own heart and he had more than one wife. Samuel's daddy had more than one wife. Jacob had more than one wife. Abraham had more than one wife. But what did the Lord say from the beginning? How many wives did he make for Adam? And you better know it. Everybody see? Oh. <laughs> so you have to think, you have to think of what, what does God say? What, what, is God's, uh, what does God's word say? Everybody see? And I don't know who would want more than one wife anyway. One of them is enough. <laughs> and you haven't mastered communicating with that one. And you trying to look for something else? <laughs> you see, marriage to one woman is enough. You see that? Y'all got a, enough issues you got to work out. Now you think about trying to bring in a second one. You see. So, verse 34, again, we say that everything that everything that we see in this word is in here for a reason. So let's read that again. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also. Everybody see that? So that means that he was not only preaching to his disciples, but he called the people. So that means that there were people that were following him that were not his disciples. So we have to establish that, that there are two groups of people that he's talking to. His disciples and the other group of people that were just following him for whatever reason they were following him. You know, some people just like a show. Okay, let's see what the Lord's going to do today. Who, who's going to get healed today? See. So what did he say? And he said unto him, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Everybody see that? So this is, now he's he talking to this second group of people, the people that have not denied themselves, you see. So th there's a lot of people in church, but not a lot of people are disciples. To be a disciple, you have to deny yourself and follow him. There were, he fed 5,000 on one occasion, but those weren't his disciples. They were following him. They followed him three days into the desert. And it would have looked like to people standing on the outside, oh, yeah, they, they really sold out. They, 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 they're followers. But what did he say? You followed me because of what I could do for you. You knew it's something in your heart and knew I was going to feed you before you left, you see. And what did he say? Labor not for the bread that perish. All right, so let's go and keep reading. Verse 35. It says, for, what, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall do what? Now that's something that we, uh, let's think about that. And I want us as individuals, uh, don't, don't, don't look across the room Let's ask ourselves that question. Let's look at what exactly what he's saying here. For whosoever will save his life 
shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall what? So ask yourself this question. What have you given up for God? What have you lost for him? You know, God is not just something to do on the weekend. What have you given up for him? And I'm not talking about sweets when you fast. He said, if you save, if you keep your life, in other words, if you save your life, you shall lose it. You know what that's saying? If you go on about your everyday routine and just think that I'm something to do on the weekend, you're going to lose your life. You're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and the gospels, I'm telling you, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, you better have more to offer him than your, your coming to church once a week. You better, you better be standing there sure that you have a relationship with him because you don't have time. You, you, you're not going to be able to come back and do it over again. There are no do-overs once you're standing in front of him. Now, this is a question that we all have to ask ourselves what have I given up for God? Now, if there's anything less than your life, you're in trouble. I'm telling you, nothing less is going to do. When we stand before him, uh, for, for folks that's self-righteous, when you stand before him, your self-righteous ain't going to get you in heaven. Your self-righteousness, all the good deeds you've done in your flesh, that is, that's not going to get you in heaven. God don't care how many people you've helped out. Everybody understand? It, it takes more than good deeds. The Bible says that your righteousness is as filthy rags before him. So no, I don't get to pat myself on the back because I've, I've given people money, because I, I pick people up every time I see them hitchhiking. Whatever it is you think you've done that's going to get you in heaven, the, the Lord is the one that gets you there. And, and your relationship with him, and you surrendering your life to him, not your good deeds. If your good deeds was enough, then the Lord would not have ever had to come and die on that cross. The Bible says, now, you know, of course, you, you, you've heard that lie, nobody's perfect, and that's a lie. The Bible says that Job was a perfect man. Abraham, perfect. And people today, perfect, if they surrender to God with their whole hearts, see. Job was a perfect man. But you know what? Jesus Christ still had to come and die for him. You know why? Because his perfection was not good enough to atone for what was done in the Garden of Eden. So what am I saying? If we are really followers of Christ, then we give up something. Our own lives. Oh, I had all kind of ambitions when I was in the world. And when I wasn't following the Lord, the Lord told me to start preaching when I was 12, and I did everything but that. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to retire from the Navy. And I felt like, you know, I joined the Navy at 17. I'll retire at 37. Except that didn't happen. And you know when the Lord's hand is on you, whether it's good or bad, you're going to do what he tells you to do. I had in my mind, you know what? I'm going to be one of the youngest people to have ever retired. 
I'm, I, that's what I was thinking. I joined the Navy at 17 and retired at 37, do 20 years and get out and, 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 and uh, retire at 37. But you know, the Lord had a different plan. I went to college and got a degree in engineering and retired at 32. You see how the Lord's plan is always better. Always better. There's something for us to think about. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it. I retired, I think I retired at 31 on my 31st birthday. It was December 6, 2005. My 31st birthday, that was my last time punching a clock. So then my wife and I, we get married. And she retired at 43, and we're both 44 now. And I remember, you know, we, us were sharing with family members that she's retired, and they asked, well, how are y'all making it? How, you know, y'all, how old are y'all? Oh, we the same age we were yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Because people got in their minds, you, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, when you do things God's way, it's, it's always better. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that's everybody's lot. But I'm telling you, when you lose your life for God's sake, his plan is always better. It's got a world full of people, full of people that's outside of God's will. You know, when you're outside of God's will, you have to make your own way, and, and you'll be frustrated. You know, it never made sense to me. It never made sense to me that you have to be in your 60s to get what you've been putting in the pot all these years. Was the average man lived to be 70? So I've been working for 40 years, 50 years, and I'm only going to enjoy it for a few years? Does everybody understand? You know, God wants the, the Bible, the Lord said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. And, and what I find, me personally, uh, when you do things God's way, it, it, don't, it takes almost no effort on your part. I feel sorry for people that's got to kick open doors for themselves. That's not God's will. And so the Lord tells us, if, if you save your life, you will lose it. You know what that means? If, if you work out your own plan, you got your plan mapped out, and you try to work that out that way, you're going to lose your life. You're not going to be able to stand before God with a clear conscience. Now, I want you to think about that. What that must feel like to stand before the Almighty One. Not your sister on the side of you, not your cousin, not your husband, not your wife, just you. And you can't look behind you and say, well, you know what? Now, this person here, they were really bad on earth. You, when you stand before him, it, it, nothing, nobody else matters. You're going to stand before your creator. What are you going to be able to tell him? You know, there was a song that people used to sing when I was growing up. Is my living in vain? That's a scary song when you're not saved. I, I didn't want to hear it. That's, it was just spooky to me. 
except when my living stopped being in vain. Well, what they were saying is you're living in vain. In other words, are, are you living a vain life? What are you doing for God? You, you, you being a good person don't count. Everybody understand? Nobody's good outside of God. You know why? Because the Bible says God is love. And then when you go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, if I give my life to be burned, if I give, if I give my body to be burned, and I have not love, what does it profit? In other words, you know, people can die for you, can get in front of a bullet for you, and still die and go to hell? You know why? Because if love is not there, then their motive was wrong. And you know, some people only do things for people just to pat themselves on the back and say they're doing it. God is not fooled by ulterior motives. See, So in other words, we have to be real. We have to be willing to give up our life for God. And, and this is a question I want you all to ask yourselves. What have you given up for him? What sacrifices have you made? You know, as, as some of us, we, we can't even stand to hear holy preaching. Just regular Bible preaching. If you can't stand, now the Bible says that, that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. If you can't stand that, then how do you think you've given up anything for God? If you are dead, then it's impossible for your flesh to get offended. Does everybody understand? My daddy, as big and as bad as he was when he walked this world, folks around him didn't want to offend him. But he's deceased now. You can walk around his grave. You ain't got to worry about him getting up. Like, look, will you quit stepping on this piece of ground here? You can talk about him, bad about him, whatever it is you do, it's not going to bother him. You know why? Because flesh is dead. If flesh is dead, if your flesh is dead, if you have gave up your life for Christ and your flesh is dead, you're not going to get offended. Your feelings ain't going to get hurt. Everybody understand? The devil operates in the realm of flesh. And so we have to be willing to ask ourselves that. What have I given up for God? Verse 36, for what shall it profit a man? Everybody see that? What does it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and do what? I had all kind of ambitions when I was in junior high and high school. I wanted to be a lawyer. I felt like I was pretty good at, at arguing and getting people to see my point. What would have happened if I had just flat out just rejected God's call altogether? might not be living today. Because uh, I've been in all kinds of situations where it wasn't anybody but God that got me out of it. So what happens when we think we can put God on a back burner and just, listen, when you get saved, all your ambitions is supposed to be turned to him. Okay, God, this was my plan, but what are your plans? For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? Everybody see that? You can gain the whole world. And lose your soul. Let's go, hold your spot there. Well, actually, let's, let's go and keep reading. Verse 37. Or what shall a man give in exchange for it? So you know what that means? Now those two, those two verses, they go together. You gain the whole world if it was possible. I own everything. Now this thing, I'm going to just say me. I own it all. I own your house, your house, your car, everything is mine. 
but you, your, all your vehicles, they belong to me. But you know what? I can't drive but one of them at a time. Your labor belongs to me. Everything you own, all your cups in your house, your dishes, they all belong to me. All the money in the world belong to me. And when I stand before God, he won't accept any of it to let me into heaven. Everybody see? What you accomplish in this world naturally, God can care less about it if it's not for the kingdom sake. It's not about how good I am to other people. It's about am I pointing them to Christ? Whatever I do for people, if they don't know that I have a love for God and a sincere love for their soul, then what does it profit them? Everybody see? If I'm not pointing people to Christ, then why am I still alive? If, if, if I'm doing something for people, if, I'm, if people just, if I have this reputation, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, people say, oh, Brother Bolton, he's a good man. He's a good man. He does this. He does that. And if they're not including God in on that, if they're not saying, but it's God on the inside of him working that way, then who's getting glory? What does it matter how good I am if my soul is in trouble? You see? That's my, that's my ambition. I know I'm going to heaven. And I, I want, and I want everybody that I know to get there. And the first thing that I have to do, I have to do my part and live a holy life and a righteous life and be sold out to Christ. You know why? Because if I'm not and my flesh is not dead, then when I'm trying to witness to people, they're going to turn up their nose, they're going to do something, and it's going to get under my skin, and then I'm going to write them off. In other words, if my flesh is not crucified, I'm not doing anybody else any good. If I'm not sold out to Christ, then I can't, sell any, I can't help get anybody else sold out to Christ. <laughs> How many of you, when you were in school, you had a study buddy? Somebody that was helping you study. So if you were making C's and D's, <laughs> what good was somebody going to do you that was making the same grades you were making? No, I wanted somebody smarter than me. Somebody that could catch on better, that could convey the information over to me. That's, that's who I needed to help me, you see. And so if, if, if I'm not sold out to Christ, then it, it would be impossible for me to be able to point people to him, you see. Verse 38. So verse 37, on what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Everybody see that? What? There's nothing. You, you, you can't give anything in exchange for your soul. There's nothing in this. Let's go look at that. Let's go to the 50th chapter, of, uh, 50th number of Psalms. Fiftieth number of Psalms. We're going to start reading at uh, verse seven. Actually, we'll start reading verse <laughs> verse five. It says, "Gather, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens." So, everybody, see what he's saying there. Gather my saints unto me, those that have made a covenant. In other words, those that have a relationship with me through sacrifice. Or by sacrifice, verse 6. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against thee. Everybody see. 
I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. Everybody see that? That's important that you get what he's saying here. Who, who, is, who did he say gather unto him? The people that have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. And look at what he's saying. I will not, verse 8, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy foals. You know why? Verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine. Everybody see? So he's talking to us who are pompous, who are proud in what we think we're doing for God. You see what he's called for? He called for the people who had a relationship with him by sacrifice. In other words, they were sacrificing animals. And he said, I'm not going to reprove you for doing that. But I'm not going to take anything out of your house from you. You know why? Because it's mine to begin with. There's a scripture that says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know why? Because that breath is his. And we ought not to be thinking, well, shoot, I got it in today. The Lord must have really, I know he really appreciated my worship. You know what God says? That, that's my air you're breathing anyway. There, no flesh is going to glory in his sight. You see? So look at what he says. Verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountain and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Everybody see? And I'm, I said it before and I'm going to say it again. This next scripture we're going to read, that right there. That let me know just how smart God is. He, <laughs> the original, I'm going to put you in your place. And be smart about it. Look at what he says. Verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. If I was hungry, you wouldn't know anything about it. Because all this belongs to me and to begin with. What is he saying? Why is, why is he... Why, look, let's go ahead and keep reading. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Everybody see what he's saying there? Anything that we do for God, we can worship him, we can preach, we can sing, or we can go feed the hungry. Any good deed that you can think of that you can do. It means absolutely nothing to God without a relationship with him. Everybody understand? I mean, it means nothing to him if you don't have a relationship with him. You know why? Because your life belonged to him already to begin with. That's why, he can, that, that's, that's why he can determine where you go when you leave here. How many of you have ever gotten a gift from somebody that you had bought for yourself? Are you going to think much of that? Your birthday coming up, and you notice that that clock on the wall is missing? And then on your birthday surprise, look what we got you. Except it was already yours. <laughs> That's what the Lord think about us patting ourselves on the back. We have to have a sincere, a sincere relationship with God. I'm telling you, before you leave here, you make sure you know him. Make sure you know him. Let's back, up a, let's back up a chapter. Let's go to verse, um, chapter 49. We're 
We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. In other words, I'm talking to everybody. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline mine ear to hear a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Everybody see. Now, just in case y'all didn't know, some of you may not know, the book of Psalms was just that. It was a book of songs. That They sang these scriptures. Everybody see. They, these were songs that were written. All right, let's go and keep reading. Verse 5. Wherefore should I fear the Lord? Uh, should I fear in the days of evil? When the iniquity of my hills shall compass me about, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. Everybody see that? Let's read that again, verse 5. Wherefore, in other words, why, what would cause me to fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my hill shall compass me about? In other words, what causes this? People that trust in their wealth. and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. You know why they fear? Because that's not guaranteed. A person can be a multimillionaire and still be working. You know why? Fear. Just in case something fall through, something don't happen, you know. And I'm going to tell you, the devil will always give you a reason to be disobedient to God. You can have enough money for your children to live off of and your grandchildren, but you know what? They're going to have great-grandchildren. That's fear. When I retired, I had less than $100 in the bank. And have never once worried about how bills were going to get paid. When it was all said and done, my wife and I, we paid cash for our place now. And we paid cash for this building you're sitting in now. now why am I saying that? Because God is the one. It wasn't because we saved up all this money. It wasn't because we were good planners or we had a retirement fund. You know, it, we just walked in wisdom and followed God. Everybody see? We paid cash because it was God's will and he made sure that we had it. And, you know, I, you've heard me say it before, I almost hate talking about stuff like that. I almost hate, I almost don't like talking about it. But if you just knew, if, if you just knew how God is and how good he is and how he, when you, in his will, how he, he puts things in your lap. My wife and I aren't rich. We don't have a lot of money in our bank account. But this Bible that we just read, God said, I own, the world is mine in the fullness thereof. If my daddy rich, I'm rich. Yeah. And so when you, when you uh, are sold out to God, you know, it, it takes some getting used to as first, especially when you first get into it, it takes some getting used to just learning to do things the way he wants you to do them and following him by faith. You know, and I'm going to just use this as an example. The Lord can tell me, go and, uh, go and upgrade your laptop so you can do the work I've called you to do, you know, with the editing. Go and update that. Oh, but you know, I, I can get by with this and all. Go and update it because it's going to be some other stuff come down the pike. You need to, well, Lord, I only got uh, 300. I need to, you know, I need to save that. What am I going to do? Be obedient or wait for 
some other breakthrough. No, if all I got is 300, I'm gonna go and pay 300. And you know what happened? Before the week is out, I got more than that. But you know what happens? If I'm waiting on God to come through before I do what he tell me to do, then he ain't gonna come through. So it, it, your mind have to change towards that. You know, the Lord, it came time for them to pay taxes. He didn't tell Peter, go on the money back. Oh, we've been saving. We know the devil was coming with this tax stuff. We already know the, the, the plan. Go, you know, we, we got that discernment. Go in the money back. You know that they had a money bag. Go in the money bag and, 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 and pay the taxes with that. What did he tell Peter? Go fishing. The first fish that you catch, open his mouth. Take the money out of his mouth and go pay taxes with that. You see how God operates. When you live for God and when you sold out to him, every, every, your whole living is on faith. God is not against people being rich. He's not against people being wise with their money. He's against you trusting in your wisdom. He's against you having it all figured out and not inquiring of him of how you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to do. That's what the Bible means when it says trusting in riches, trusting in, in wealth. And I tell you, it's very sobering when you realize we all just one house fire away from homelessness. When folks are homeless, they're not born that way. It don't take anything for God to blow on what we've stacked up. That's why I don't trust in that. If you, my daddy was born the year the stock market crashed, 1929. Brother Junior tells me stories of how he saw grown men weeping and crying every day because they could not find work. Some men, some people actually committed, a lot of people committed suicide when the stock market crashed. Jumping out, trying to find the tallest building in their city to jump from. You know why they did that? Because they trusted in riches. They trusted in their own ability versus trusting in God. They had not sold out to God. Now God is not wanting us to be robots where we're oblivious to things. Nobody, don't, nobody likes not having money right away. But I tell you, it's a whole different life. It's a whole different life when you're, you're not concerned with what's in your bank account. When, when you're completely sold out to God and you know, God, if it's your will, I'll have it. I, I, can't, I wish I could tell you. I'm, I can go down the line of, of things that the, the Lord have done. And you know the sad part, and, and one of the reasons why I don't like sharing it is because I know some people aren't there yet. And, and it's like you, will, you just won't understand the peace that comes with not being worried about this world, not being worried about material things. My wife and I, we, we bought that property. We bought this here. We even own that graveyard across the street. And you know, we, we went over there one time to see it. And see those people, that they're buried over there. They used to come to this church. And you know, when my wife and I, when we bought this building and this property, we didn't have to kick anybody out. We didn't have to tell them, y'all got 30 days. Y'all better have, have all the church you're going to have because in 30 days, y'all got to get out of here. You know what happened? People died. And they left these things behind right over there in that graveyard. On the way here, if you're, if you're driving this back road here, on the way here, you'll see a building that was this church at one time. It used to sit right there where that cross is. They put that cross there. To, to signify where the original church was. You'll see that building, it was built in the 1880s, if I'm not mistaken. It's sitting in a man's backyard right around the corner here. 
people that had church in that building, they're no longer alive. When I was, when I was in um, Tulsa, I was going to real estate school, and the first night, my first class, the man, uh, the teacher, he said, you know, now he wasn't even a man living for the Lord, but he said, you know, when, when you're selling real estate, you know what you're really selling? You're really selling people's, them the ability to have a house for the duration of their life. It's not really theirs. It's just something they can live in for the rest of their life. And then they're gonna have to pass it on to somebody else. That was a very sobering thought. Well, you think about that. Anything that you buy, if it lasts, you're not gonna be able to take it with you. Somebody's gonna have to take it. When I was in the hospital back in 1997, I was sharing a room with an old man. Apparently this man was well off. And uh, I had the pleasure of his children coming in, in the room. Hello, Daddy. Several of them standing around his bed, spoke to him, he, and his wife is in, in, a, in a room uh, down the hall. And, and they spoke to their daddy, and he just laying in bed, and he spoke back. And then they started talking amongst themselves. So I'm gonna get his boat. You, you can take the truck. Uh, you, you can take the house. And they're having this discussion right there in front of them. I thought, now that's odd and uh, rude. But then I thought, but you know, I guess that's the way it is. They, the, the daddy was on his deathbed. You're about to leave here, sir. And I don't care how many notes you paid on your house, on your car, how nice you built it up, you're going to have to leave that behind. What does it profit a man? Everybody see. Now I hope, I hope I get all your minds churning on that. You think about all of the possessions that God have allowed you to have. Do you ever think, I'm going to have to pass that, we're going to have to pass this on to our children? Or do you think you're going to live forever with it? That's something. I have it sitting in front of me. Uh, this is my daddy's wallet. I got this wallet before most of you were born. My mother gave it to me in 1986. And I, when I first got the wallet, it had things in it. All of his receipts. He owned several vehicles when he died. I saw all the receipts for those. It had a lot of things in there. In, in the very front of it was my picture. And then behind that was a picture of my sister right up under me. And, and, and his driver's license. In fact, his driver's license is still in it. And I saw on his license, now my daddy died July 23rd, 1981. He took that picture, he, that license, he got in April of that same year. A, a big smile on his face. And I thought he probably didn't know that three months later he was gonna be gone. He was smiling like he had another 50 years to live. And all of the vehicles, I mean, we had several vehicles parked in the yard. I, I've seen my daddy give away vehicles for $200 that were perfect vehicles, just wanting to be a blessing to people. If he loved you, you had the best friend in the world, and it wasn't nothing that he wouldn't do for you. And so when he died, we had several vehicles in, in the yard, several of them, all, and ran. But then I remember after he died, I remember just one by one, men coming by the house, giving mama money and then driving them off one by one until we were down to one or two. This wallet belonged to my stepdaddy that passed away, um, was it 2012? And I remember we got the call saying he had died unexpectedly, wasn't sick, wasn't nothing, had never been sick a day in his life. He lived, I think, to be 86 years old, never sick and worked up until he died. Both of them men worked in the woods. They were loggers. And they were friends when they were in this world together. And just all of a sudden, he died. I got a call from my sister sitting right here. I got to the house. There he was, laid out on the living room floor. All of the children, his, he, had, he had 10 biological children. 
some of them, the ones that were still living and in town, they all came over to the house to see him laid out on the, uh, on the living room floor waiting on the coroner to come get him. And we got down there a few, a few days later after he passed and we pulled our truck up in the driveway and got out, walked under the carport. There were his shoes because what he would do when he would go and work in the woods, he'd come home and he, he had a chair out there on the uh, carport. He'd sit down in that chair and he'd take his boots off and put some comfortable shoes on. And there were his shoes right there. Went to the backyard, there was his truck. Went into the shed to get something out of the shed for mama. There were all of his chainsaws, his, his boat in the backyard, all of this stuff, just like that, belonged to somebody else. My wife and I, we slept in, in the bedroom that he slept in, well, you know, as guests when we got there. And there were all the pictures of his children, his TV, all of those things left behind, his clothes still in the closet. He died right before Mother's Day, and he had bought my mother a Mother's Day card, and that was the card on the bed. Never got a chance to give it to her. And I thought, you know, it's true. It's true. You can't take anything with you. You can buy all kind of stuff and have all kind of plans of what you're going to do with it. When God calls your number, that's it. Now, I, I, I want us to think that way. I look at all the things that the Lord has blessed my wife and I with. See, that's why I don't get caught up in, in material things. If the Lord tarry, we're going to have to leave this stuff behind. God don't care about how neat you are, how many vehicles you got. When it's all said and done, it's going to be you and your neck itself standing before him. And we're going to have to give an account of what we've done, not just for, you know, God, I was a good person. God don't care about how good you were. Did you have a relationship with him? Did you lose your life for his sake? That's the only thing that he, that, that he want to hear. Everybody see? He doesn't care about how much money you had, how good your credit was. He said, all you people, poor and, poor and rich, I'm talking to you. You see? Let's go ahead and keep reading here. Verse 7. It says, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases, ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to who? Others. No, I'm not going to fight you over something you stole from me. Not when I'm going to have to leave it behind anyway. And the devil got people fighting over stuff they're going to have to die and leave behind. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 11. Now, now this is, you have to pay attention to this. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Everybody see that? This city that we are in now. This was named after a man. That's what he's talking about. In other words, people live. If they're outside of God, they live to make a God out of themselves and they live to leave a legacy for people to worship after they are gone. Look at that big old nice house that Brother Bowden used to live in. But when it's all said and done, what house is this flesh going to be in? It's going to be a, in a coffin six feet under. It does not matter what kind of riches I obtain. It means absolutely nothing if I don't have a relationship with God. And you know what I think? Is, it would be sad 
for people to live and, and, re- and experience the blessings of God. God, you know, the Bible says he reigned on the just as well as the unjust. He, he, you know, uh, uh, saved people aren't the only one getting blessed. So he, he gives all things freely to people to enjoy. He don't have a problem with showing you his goodness even though you don't know him. But what I think is a shame is that people are experiencing the blessings of God and still don't know him. That's where the blessing is. Let's go and keep reading. Verse 12, nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not, he is like the beast that perish. This their way is their folly, in other words, their foolishness. Yet their posterity approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. And everybody see that? I don't care how rich you are, how much money you got when you leave here, your flesh is going to decay. Yes, that flesh you were so concerned about. Everybody understand? If I can just lose 20 pounds and get back in my... You're going to lose it. (laughs) 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 And I know we don't like talking about it, but you know what? People die. And if the Lord tarry, we're going to die. The question is, have we made preparation for it? And I know I'm not talking about burial insurance or your your kin folks aren't setting up GoFundMe accounts. (laughs) My sister, (laughs) my sister, after her and her last husband had divorced, my mama had a talk with her, said, Lena, you got any burial insurance or life insurance and anything like that? You, you know, you need to, you ain't got no husband now. You need to be, you know, watchful of that. You ain't got no children. You, you know, you need to start preparing. You know, you need to get yourself some burial insurance. And my sister said, no, I ain't got none. I don't care what y'all do with me when I'm gone. <laughs> You can put me in a ditch. What does it matter to me? <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I think about that sometimes. I've, I've, I've talked to my wife about it. You know, I, I had thought about getting me one of those fancy beds that you can let up and down, the sleep number bed, it adjusts all, you know, the firmness and the softness and stuff. And you, you, you know, you, now, here's my kicker. When folks start saying, you know, call us and we'll send you a catalog, then I know, okay, so y'all, this is out the box with, with money. In other words, if I got to get a catalog, you just can't tell me the price up front. I know I'm going to be making payments. <laughs> but I thought, you know, t- to be comfortable, maybe we ought to invest in that. Now, I, I think those beds, you can get them for around 3000 and that's a lot of money for a bed, isn't it? But you think about your final bed, that coffin. You know, most people, they spend, what, five, $600 on a mattress set, $1,000 at that? How much does that last mattress cost, people? They start off about $5,000. And it always, you will never, ever in this life make me understand or agree to it. Of why we are paying five and six thousand dollars for coffins to put them in the ground. It, it would be halfway different to me if it was made of glass and some kind of way you could just sit on top of the ground and anytime you wanted to go see grandma, they were there uh, undecayed. That might be worth a five thousand dollar investment. Uh, and they have them looking so comfortable laying in there. 
except they're stiff, frozen, just long enough for you to see them. I, I got a picture. I don't know if I, I, some of you may have seen it or not. I have a picture of my family, my mother and my sister and my brother and with several of our family members out there at the gravesite in July of 1981 with my daddy's coffin suspended above the ground. And I can remember those men, those four men, getting on each corner of that coffin and lowering it into the ground. And, and I can remember them taking shovels and covering him up. And I remember touching that coffin and thinking about how nice it looked, only to see it go into the ground and be, and be covered with dirt. Now, isn't that life? We spend more for our bed in dying than we do in living. Now, if that's the case, then shouldn't we start preparing our minds? Well, we're going to be concerned with what God says to us when we stand before him in person. Then just trying to gather up a whole life that we're not listening. We are in, you know, I can halfway even say that we were living to be a thousand. It's making the news when somebody make a hundred. You think about back in the day, folks living to be 969, 600 years old, and still working. And now somebody make 100 is on the news. You know that's not a long time? You young people that's in your 20s, I remember when I was in my 20s. You teenagers, I remember when I was a teenager. I remember when I turned 13 thinking, man, I'm a teenager. I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost out of the whipping phase. <laughs> and I remember thinking back then of what my life would be now. I remember wondering, am I going to have children? Is the Lord going to bless me with a wife? What kind of woman is she going to be? What her shape going to be like? You know, that's, that's the way men think. I don't know what women thinking. Yeah, I know what y'all thinking. What kind of job is he going to have? <laughs> <laughs> How is he going to bless me? <laughs> Is he going to look good and, and we be the envy of everybody, you see? <laughs> and what I find, you know, so not only do my wife and I, we have children, we have grandchildren. And all of our grandparents are deceased now. Both of our biological dads are deceased. That's, that's something to think about. Life continues. It, it continues. You see? This world continues. No matter how much of a star you are, how much people love you and worship you, when you were here, when you're gone, all of that's over with. And then what? Michael Jackson, a very rich man, built himself a whole theme park. On the catalog, the Beatles catalog, some of the richest music in history. And when he left here, he had to leave all of that behind. I want you to think about that in the moment that he died and people got wind of that. People out in the streets dancing to his music. But where was he? Standing before God, giving an account of the deeds done in his body. And he couldn't tell God, look God, they all, see how they all love me? People love me. 
I sung to those people for years. I entertained them. I made them feel good about themselves. And look at the, how they're showing their appreciation. They're, they're stopping traffic. Whole cities are shut down to pay tribute to me. The major networks are going to cancel their own programming to show my funeral. That's how much they love me. And you know what God's question is? But did you love me? Forget about your name in the world. Forget about all these people you sung to. That, that's, that doesn't, I wasn't moved by that. Did you have a relationship? Do I know you? Everybody see? And I'm not saying these things to speak bad about him. I'm just saying this is the reality. No matter what you've accomplished in life, no matter how great your name was, no matter how much money you got saved in the bank, no matter how good you lived, is God pleased with you? Go ahead and keep reading. Verse 14, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their what? Dwelling. Everybody see that? Let's think about how vain we can be with how we look, how nice our hair looks. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't look nice, but, I'm, you know, some people, they just, it's an extreme. Think about how, how the devil can take our thoughts and we can just be so consumed with ourselves in flesh, more worried about how we look naturally so. Well, I got a, I got a beer belly. I need to do some sit-ups. You know, because it's, you know, you see that foolishness, you know, folks posted on social media, you know, it's almost time, almost bikini time. I'm going to get myself in shape for those one or two times I'm going to go to the beach. <laughs> but when fall comes, it's just all, I'm going to just let it all hang. I'm going to gain all the weight back. I starved myself to lose. You know, I used to hear old people say, you, the devil got you worried about the wrong thing. <laughs> they said that Marilyn Monroe had the perfect body of her generation, what they consider the perfect body. You know, which is crazy to me because for, for you women that don't know, men have different tastes, and we all don't have the same taste. So there is no one fall had the perfect body according to world standards and there was a man that was sent to her to talk to her about the Lord this was a famous preacher in fact, it was Billy Graham. Sent to talk to her about the Lord. And she basically said, I don't need your God. I'm rich and I'm famous. And around that same time, there was another famous preacher out in the woods hunting by the name of William Branham. And the Lord spoke to him. and said, there's a famous woman that's about to leave here. I'm about to take her life. And he told him, people are gonna say that she died of a drug overdose, but that's not so. She's gonna die of a heart attack. 
And they're going to think that because it's pills everywhere that that's what did her in, but that's not what it is. It's just her time to go. And if you know the story, they found her sprawled across the bed. What had happened, she was having a heart attack and she was trying to get to the phone to dial 911 and never made it. And the position they found her in, she was reaching for the phone, like she was reaching across the bed to get it. All of the fame and all the wealth that this woman had. And that's for all of us, no matter, you know, because listen, poor people, just because you're poor and had a hard life, that don't, you don't get a pass either. <laughs> you don't, the heaven not going to let you in because it feels sorry for you. <laughs> I, you know, I am aware every day that I'm mortal. This flesh... The, w the way I'm living now, that's not going to always be. I am mortal. My soul is going to live forever somewhere. But the way things are now, the way you could see, because listen, what you're seeing now is not the real me. This is just my earth suit that the Lord allows me to walk around in. That's what's going back to the dust. It is confined there. That's what, see, that's why I'm not concerned. I, I'm not concerned about this earth suit. The Lord will let it live as long as he chooses to let it live. Doesn't matter how many push-ups I do, how many miles I jog a day, it, it doesn't matter. I, I can't escape God's confines of when I'm supposed to leave here. I live next door to a man uh, who was real big into working out and doing all these things. And uh, he said, you know, my brother just passed, and we done, it's just baffling our minds because he was in good shape. Like, are you crazy? Since when does a person being in shape stop God from taking their life? The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die. It, you have an appointment. Everybody understand? Now, if you know somebody that was able to escape that and still living, you let me know. But we have an appointment, and listen, it ain't scary when you know that you're right with God. And so you know what I do and what we all have to do? We have to live like we have an appointment. Live like at any moment you can leave here. People die young all the time. You know it's not meant for all of us to get old? John the Baptist was what, 30 when he died? Jesus Christ, 33 when he died? They were young men. And both righteous. Everybody see? So we have an appointment, and we can't think, well, daddy lived to be 80, so that I'm, I'm at least good for 70. <laughs> No, we have to live like, you know, Lord, at any moment you could take my life. And, 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 and listen, it's not a bad thing. We're not talking about this like it's a bad thing, like, oh, we dreading death. I don't dread it. I would dread it if I wasn't right with God. But if I'm right with God, I don't dread it. That, that's how I enter into eternity with him. But the question is, am I ready? Are you ready? You know why I think sometimes people have a hard time with the death of love, their loved ones, especially when they are saved, when, when the person that lost, is, that lost the person is saved? You, you have a hard time with it when you're not sure of what they're going to spend in eternity. Everybody see? But you know what? We don't have to live like we don't know. If you don't know what you're guaranteed of, I, I can tell you this, you're guaranteed two things, to die and stand before God. 
Those are guaranteed. Everything else you might be able to escape. You can tax evade, you can do all that stuff. Even taxes, you know, you can do all kind of stuff. But you're guaranteed to leave here to give up this flesh. And you're guaranteed to stand before him. So if you know that those are guarantees, then shouldn't it be in your mind, well, I need to start prepping for that. This is what I need to start getting prepared for. You see? Let's go look at one more scripture. Let's go to the book of Luke. Uh, let's go to the 12th chapter of the book of Luke. And we're going to start reading Let's start reading at verse 10. Now this is the Lord talking. He says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues, and unto magistrates, and powers, Take ye no thought how or what, ye, what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that, in the same hour, what ye ought to say. Everybody see what he's talking about now? He's just talking, just prepping his disciples for what they can expect uh, as they continue to preach. That they are going to be brought before people. People are going to hate them. And he's saying, don't have in your mind what you're going to say. The Lord, the Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. Don't, so don't worry about that. So I, I wanted to start right there because I wanted you to see where it goes from there to this. Verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, do what? Speak to my heart and help me to, help me to get to that point where I'm not concerned. No, what? Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Everybody see? Now we talking about Holy Ghost stuff. What is your mind on? Mom and daddy gone and my brother ain't, ain't treating me right with all, you know, he's not wanting to divide that stuff with me. Look, look, this is a classic response. And he said unto him, man, everybody see? Who made me a judge or a divider over you? Are we even talking about this? So you see where the man come in at. Like, are you crazy? We're not even talking about this stuff. So what is the man back there doing? Now the Lord is carrying on with all this sound doctrine. And he back there thinking, well, you know, God is good. And he don't want me to go without. <laughs> he's, he's a just God. He gonna make it right. Now they've been mistreating me. You know. He saw the best in me. <laughs> they, they thought I was a loser. And they, even when mom and dad is gone, they try to mistreat me. So I'm a tiptoe on up here as soon as I get a break. And what happened? The Lord put him in his place. Man, who? That, that ain't my business. I'm here for souls, not for you dividing stuff. Look at what this is. Verse 15, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Everybody see that? What was that? Covetousness. And you know, it's people walking around today sour over how they think they've been done wrong when it comes to material possessions. 
What is the Lord saying? You don't even bring that junk to me. In fact, he talked the other way. If a man take your coat, give him your cloak as well. A man wants you to go one mile, go two with him. In other words, what? Do whatever you got to do to keep yourself from getting bitter over material. And how you think you're being mistreated. Your life is more than that. And you've heard me say before, you ought to make the devil come for you. If he's coming for your soul, you ought to make him work for it. It ought not to be simple. It ought to take more to get you, get under your skin. Everybody understand? If the devil come for you, he ought to be sending his generals. When you live for God, he, he, ought to be, he ought to have to send his top devils. Not just something where you saw how they looked at me. <laughs> you see how, you see what they, what they I, I, I don't think, I don't feel the love here. And I, like I said before, if, if that's where the devil can get you, you're at the bottom. You're, you're at the bottom. Everybody see? Do you remember what, what one of Jesus' last words were to his disciples? Right when he was done praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, come, let us go. He said, the, the devil is come from, coming for me, and he can find nothing in me. You know what he meant when he said that? He's going to come with all kinds of junk, but there's nothing on the inside of me that he can get me with. I'm mature. He can't get me with offense because he's been trying that for the three and a half years. I've been raising the dead, healing the sick, and folks still got something bad to say. I'm over that. He, he's got to come. He's got to come with lies. Everybody understand? He can't just come with offense. See, the devil is trying to get the Lord to kill himself through his own offense. Constantly as he's preaching, people rejecting him. Trying to kill him. Could you imagine? He didn't have time to go off into his little hut and say, well, you know, I'm doing all this good. Why don't people love me? He understood if people are ordained to eternal life, they'll accept him. So he was mature. He, 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 he understood everybody's not going to accept me, and I don't expect them to. Listen, it, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, how much good you've done. Listen, do not, you cannot live trying to impress people or trying to make people think that you're a good person. Because even in that, it's vain. People are going to think what they want to think. How many of you have done that? I, you know, I'm a... I'm giving to this person. I'm doing this. Surely they know I'm a good person. They're they going to really thank God for me. What it's all come down to is God is the one you need to be impressing. He's the one you ought to be living for, see. And so he, he told this man, and he told them all, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou what? No, not you wise person, you wise. That, ain't, that was nothing but, that was the spirit of wisdom that had you Laying up for retirement like that. Fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. You know what he was saying? 
you're going to die tonight. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So that was the problem. God did not have a problem with the man laying up treasures. He did not have a problem with the man preparing for retirement. He had a problem with the man not being rich towards him. What was the man's fault? Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, con continue not to live for God. You got it made. You don't have, ever have to depend on God. If that is your purpose for working, for saving, so that you don't have to depend on God, you're a fool. Everybody understand? Because I'm, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how much money you got, God can come blow on it. When Hurricane Rita came through my hometown, uh, back in, I think it was 2005, Didn't have a whole lot of money in the bank. But I knew some people that did. But you know what? People that had that money in the bank couldn't go and withdraw it. You know why? Because the electricity was shut down. And so there we were, poor, and millionaires alike standing behind a truck waiting for water. God has a way of putting us all in the same boat. Because the truth is we're all there to begin with. Everybody understand? No matter how much money you got, you still have to stand before God. You still have to have to trust him. You can say, well, you know what, I, I, you know, I'm, I got money. I don't, I don't have to worry about that. And, and then now the banks, they got, they got, you know, backup generators. So, we, you know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Who's to say that God won't put you on your back? You, you, you can't go withdraw money from an ATM on a stretcher. In other words, you can't get around God. And then when it's all said and done, just like this man, thou fool, this night is thy soul required of thee. This man left all those riches that he had been working for years for. And he had to stand before God as a fool. Isn't that something? You, you've been working and building up for what? They say Bill Gates, of course, he's a billionaire. And the only thing he left his children, when he, their inheritance is going to be $10 million. And when he first announced that, people had a problem with it. They thought, well, you're a billionaire. You can afford to give each one of your children a billion dollars at least. But you know what he said? No. If they can't take $10 million and make a whole life out of it and build a billion, then they don't need a billion. Now, you think about that. If you can't take $10 million and live off of that for the rest of your life, and you squander that, you don't need a billion to squander. Why? Wow, what did he understand? At some point, they're going to have to leave here. You see that? And that's for all of us. We're going to all have to leave and give an account of the things that we do in this body. Are we laying up treasures here in this earth, or are we storing up treasures in heaven? In other words, is heaven taking an account of what we're doing now? We say how God has blessed us. We say the word we receive from the Lord is valuable. Do we share that word with people? 
if it's valuable to us, we should share it. And I'm afraid some of us, uh, we're more concerned with showing somebody a new dress that we got, a new pants that we got. Are we showing people how God is operating and what he's doing in our lives? You see. Let's, let's think about that. Let's start thinking about heaven. Let's think about what we can do to help other people get there. Lesson, because I, I, I can be a witness to that. When you are sold out to God, God takes care of the rest. He takes care of the natural things. I didn't have to go and beg God for finances for, any, for anything. He's always, all I have to do is do what he called me to do. Uh, the rest of it is taken care of. It's really just that simple. So if, if I, if, if, but that's for all of us, not just for preachers. If we will do what God wants us to do, then he takes away that worry that we have about other things that, that the devil have been tormenting us with. Think about all of your possessions, all of the things that you enjoy now. Let's not get so caught up in those natural things because all that stuff is going to be left behind. I'm not attached to anything that the Lord has blessed me with. And I've always felt like that that whatever God blesses me with, I have no problem. If the Lord tells me to give it away, it's, it, it'll be given away. Because it's really only mine to use while I'm here. You see. It, it, it's, it's just temporal anyway. I remember when I bought my first car, when I, was, I had just turned 18. I'm telling you, just every day, just about, my friend and I, we were going to wash our cars. And I, I can remember, I would go out there and sit in it. Just think, man, this is nice. I, I would purposely just go, well, shoot. I, you know, I got, I got the tooth, but don't have the paste. You know, I got the catch, but not the up. I just look at Josh, I got to go to the store for something. Let me just go drive this car. <laughs> Looking for a real, oh, man, I need, I got, to get some, I got some paper, but not the paper clips. I mean, oop, got to break it with another store run. Most of us, that's the way we are until we get some sense. And we're not careful. You, you know, that new, that's, that's what's got everybody buying the iPhone 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 that comes out whenever. Just, just, the, the, just the wanting of something new. But you know what? Your relationship with God can be the same way. Every day, ooh, Lord, I'm looking forward to how you going to move today. This is every day. You ain't got to stand in a long line either. Every day. Just that excitement. Like, ooh, Lord, I'm not even about me. I can't wait to hear somebody else's testimony. I tell you, life is different when you're living for him and when you're dead to self, you see. And that's, that's what God's will is for us, to be dead to self and to live for him with our whole hearts. Let's not get caught up in this natural world that we're going to have to live, leave behind. Abraham, one of the richest men that have ever lived, but the Bible says he had no certain dwelling place. He lived in tents his whole life, was rich enough to build a mansion, but he was so sold out to God, I'm not going to even settle. I'm not going to even get settled. I'm going to live in tents for the rest of my life. And that's what he did. You know why? The Bible says because he was a man of faith and he knew in this earth we have no that he understood this earth is not our home. It's just somewhere we're living until we get to into eternity, see? So let's live like that. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you've spoken to us. We thank you, Lord, for the message that you have preached. And God, I pray that this have not fallen on deaf ears, Lord, but that you will help your people to see what you were saying today. Help us, Lord, not to be mind these things that we have been blessed with, 
Help us, Lord, to think heavenly. Help us to keep our mind on eternity, Lord, and what you would have us to do until we get there. Help us, Lord, not to be so tied up into this world that we can't do anything for you, Lord. Help us to love you with a pure heart. Help us, Lord, not to make gods out of things that you have blessed us with. Help us, Lord, to keep everything in its proper place. We thank you, Lord, for coming to this world to die for us, to save our souls. Help us, Lord, not to take that lightly. And God, we pray for every individual in here that you will solidify your relationship with them, Lord. Help us all to examine ourselves to see where we are in you. If we have gotten out of the way, Lord, help us to get back in the place you've called us to be in. Lord, if we are holding unforgiveness in our hearts, even towards ourselves, I ask that you will reveal it and help us to forgive ourselves and to forgive others as well. Help us, God. Put a desire on the inside of us to get as close to you as we can. Help our relationship, Lord, be the most important thing uh, to us, our relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us all um, access to your throne of grace. Help us not to take that for granted. Thank you, Lord, that we can come before you and pray to you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that access to you. Help us to take advantage of that. Lord, help us to uh, use that, Lord, to develop our relationship with you. And God, I pray for those that are doubting that you will make yourself real to them. Let them know, Lord, that you care about their souls, that you care about where they're going to spend an eternity, Lord, and that you died for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, if that's, if that's all now, we'll go ahead and be dismissed to go to the back. <laughs>